good evening and welcome to the Super Lessons F1 podcast. My name is Rodney. And my name is Zachary. Oh, it's the excited boy, Zach, and the moderately excited boy, Rod. <laughs> you know, I'm here just to bring all the excitement. What a great race weekend with our favorite driver doing all the best things. And I just can't wait to get into the positive vibes of cre- just another great Singapore Grand Prix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it has become one of our favorite ones. I guess it's close to Australia. We've been there. Um, it's super hot, super humid. Um, you know, every humid day, I'm just reminded of what a sweat box that place is. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, you need about, like, four bottles of 100 plus to see you through mm-hmm. the day. But yeah. it's like a glittering, like, jewelry box. It's even it's even more sparkly than Monaco, I would say. All the drivers get those new sparkly helmets, and all the lights are on, which is nice. But, you know, it's, it's just a highlight in the calendar. I wish we could have, like, three Singapore-style races. I love it. <laughs> well, it is one way to describe it, and uh, another way to describe it is my race intro. So here we go. Are you looking for a race that's nestled deep in the heart of a bustling metropolis? A destination race where the atmosphere is as important as the on-track action? The kind of race where you meet a weird German or possibly Swedish guy in a bar after qualifying who may or may not have been a cannibal and later connected with Zach on LinkedIn? Well, my friend, Singapore is the race your heart desires. Just avoid the red light district, unless by district you mean the start-finish line, and by one red light you mean five red lights. Uh, with the most corners of any f1 track on the calendar all 16 turns are lit up like a christmas tree and in a twisted and slightly confused metaphor the whole track is wrapped up with a bow and placed under the tree that is the iconic marina bay sands and you're thinking rod i know what you're saying so please stop explaining well fine but regardless it's time to sprint to singapore baby Oh, I mean, how much... There's no doubt that that was better than Martin Brundles this no week. So, sorry, Al uh, David Croft. So, yes, well done. No doubt indeed. No doubt. Oof. Don't don't speak any more about how good that was. And also, spider webs. Um, Zach, we've got the Singapore Grand Prix to recap. We, we I've got a quiz. I was going to say, you've got a quiz. You don't. I've got a quiz. We're going to talk about the Fantasy League. And then, um, yeah, that's about what we do on this show, really. Generally speaking. So, I reckon, should we just do the race thing then? All right. Yeah, let's do that thing. Here's a little thing that indicates that we're about to do that. Let us raise a bit. I came from space. Set my bones, man. Let's hurry up and get out of here. We've got a race to do. Because Gwen Stefani was the entertainment at the race, you see. Well-oiled machine. Anyway, Zach, it's the uh, Singapore Grand Prix, one of our favorites of the track. It's certainly one of those pretty races. is isn't always the most exciting race, but we shook it around it. And like every race... The easiest way for us to recap the action is to have a quick 30-second recap. This time, it's your turn to summarize two hours plus of racing, basically, into 30 seconds. (laughs) Do you think you can do it? Are you going to make it? Yeah, I'm going to make it before I break it. Well, very confident. Hope I get more sick-ass rhymes like that. Are you ready? 30 seconds starting now. This was a race where Ferrari had it all to lose and Mercedes had it all to gain. And yet they didn't quite make enough gains with Ferrari kind of getting the strategy, I suppose, half right with delicious undercut of Vettel on his teammate, but rival Charles Leclerc. Charles Leclerc was not happy about this at all, but you know who was happy for at least a bit of the race? Danny Ricciardo racing through the back (laughs) of the field until one point where he was like, you know what, guys, I think I'm just going to race a little too hard. And yet... He managed Three, to get a puncture and not finish two, the race. And you know one. who else finished outside the points? Haas. Classic. Oh, yeah. Absolutely classic. Another classic 30-second recap. <laughs> He's saying very well done, mate. Didn't touch uh, it. Didn't get oh, anywhere near the things well, I wanted to talk about. <laughs> scraping against some of the walls, but that's just how you eke out those extra tents, I suppose. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to just go through? I mean, I feel like every race recap we do, it's here's what happened to the podium finishes, and then Ricardo, and then some of the back markers. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, that's this race as well, right? Well, I think that it's it's not just necessarily Ricardo, but it's it. This happens often, I think, in Formula One, at least whilst we'll be doing the podcast, which is that there are some very good, talented drivers at teams where they kind of underperform through some of the weekend, um, but those drivers can kind of drag uh, good finishes. You look at uh, Kimi Raikkonen, you look at Fernando Alonso, and I would say that these days it's definitely Daniel Ricardo. Um, and kind of trying to fight it out with the McLaren boys and the Toro Rosso boys. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, 
we are going to talk about Daniel Ricardo because he's Australian, we're Australian, and we love him. But that's, <laughs> I think he's he's been one of the kind of key movers and shakers this season because he kind of knows that this is a bit of a weird year for Renault um, and that he has to push whenever he gets an opportunity. And this week, he started from the back because uh, of swapping out bits of his car and and he was always going to make a run because they, they could take advantage of, of starting on a slightly harder tire, make a good run, and then hopefully stay out long and see if they could get a safety car. And look, he wasn't the only guy waiting for a safety car. Um, Giovinazzi, Gasly, Stroll, all were out late. In fact, Giovinazzi was leading the race the first time in, what did they say? It was like some huge number, like six was, years or something, right? Yeah, five since years Mercedes. since Belgium 2015. Yeah, since a, a, another team was leading the race that wasn't Ferrari, Mercedes, or Red Bull. So yeah, nuts. massive props for Giovinazzi, and hopefully not the last time he leads a race. Hopefully the next time he's doing it, he's doing it in a car that might actually be able to win. Um, so really, there there was lots of going on, and, and all of those midfield guys who'd try, tried to extend their first stint and stayed out were all so unlucky because finally they all had to give it up. They're like, you know what, let's come in. And then there was a safety car very soon after that. Um, so <laughs> it was it was tough because we're all expecting a safety car much earlier in the race, but we got all of them in the last, what felt like the last 10 minutes, which made the last 10 minutes of the race go for an hour. Yeah. Um, so what that did mean is that we ended up a little bit without the, the kind of run to the end, which everybody promises every single race. So... Should we just kind of wind it all the way back, Rod, and talk a little bit about Ferrari? Sure. Uh, obviously, this is a race that uh, Ferrari weren't really expecting to do particularly well. Even on Friday, they weren't thinking they were going to do well and uh, just got it dialed in. But they did bring some updates to this race, uh, some big changes, aerodynamic changes, a lot more peak downforce and uh, a more stable rear end, which is something that uh, Sebastian Vettel in particular seems to be very happy with. But just the performance, uh, I think, really caught Mercedes off guard. And this is... Definitely a track where Mercedes and Red Bull were expecting to do very well. So uh, to, for Ferrari to leave with a 1-2 is completely unexpected. But I guess the question mark for the rest of the season is, well, uh, what does the Singapore result mean for Ferrari now who have won three on the trot? And, you know, I think Mercedes have won two out of the last seven races. So it's looking um, not shaky, not uncertain for, you know, Mercedes are still going to win the championship. But uh, all of a sudden, all these other teams are getting in the mix. And it's like, well, if, if Ferrari can win a whole bunch of races, that sort of means good things, perhaps not even just for this season, but maybe next season as well. And um the, the, the sheer unexpectedness of it is uh, really pretty impressive. Uh, Leclerc in particular on for three in a row, <laughs> three poles in a row, three race wins almost in a row. And yeah, uh, well, there's been a controversy about that decision. I thought it was interesting, um, though, in particular about the the, the team fight is um, that Mercedes just weren't even on the podium, so they, they weren't even the near guys. And I mean, you could sort of argue, well, yeah, they kind of threw it away a little bit on the strategy, which I'm sure we'll get to, but, uh, they could have been there fighting. And, and this time it just seemed like in one way, Ferrari got the strategy completely right. In another way, mm, got a little bit wrong, but good result. Mercedes were in a reasonable position and got it a bit wrong on strategy. So when you have an underperforming car and an underperforming strategy, you can't expect to get on the podium. No, no, you can't. And you make a good point about what does this mean for the rest of the season for Mercedes. It's I, everybody expected Lewis Hamilton to smash this track um, and just walk away simply with the he win. He might want to I, smash I, it I right now. <laughs> yeah, well, he might be there smashing nice, it up as we speak. <laughs> this is a nice new mature Hamilton who forgets about these losses and moves on mm-hmm. to the next win. Although it now is three races since he's had well, no, how many <laughs> races since Hamilton won a race? When was the last one he won? I think he won the last one before the summer break, but I think... So he hasn't won, won one, one, one in the second half. That. Yeah, no, no, he hasn't, no, because that was Belgium and Italy and now Singapore. Wow, imagine that. Mm. Wow. He's probably forgotten what it's like to taste that sweet, sweet number one champagne, because you know you get a better... They, they yes. The champagne goes up in grades the, um, for the people <laughs> on the podium. By the time yeah. you're in third, it's been open for six weeks. Most it's, people don't know that. Really In fact, young. there's no evidence to support nice. it, but I mean, it is true. 
Ah, this is insider knowledge. The rest of the journalists mm-hmm. only care about aerodynamics and the infighting between yeah, the teams, no, no, but I care stupid. about That's what's the quality of the champagne on the podium. Um, I'll, tell you, something you should, I'll tell you something you should care about, Zach, is that Ferrari, running in uh, running at the front, unexpectedly, were able to control the pace. So for the first 20 laps, it was painfully slow. And I might not have looked at it on TV, but those drivers were going so slow. And I think at so one point, slow. George Russell set the fastest lap time. <laughs> 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 That's how slow they were going. Sorry, George, but it's true. Um yeah. Doesn't George Lewis just sound Hamilton. like a nickname for someone whose name isn't George, but it's really his name? It's funny. Anyway. Classic George. Um, yeah, and then Lewis and then Hamilton what, then also Hamilton got on the radio. Yeah. It was like, hey, man, it's so slow out there. <sighs> Nothing I can do. It's like, well, yeah, there is something you could do. You could drive a bit faster and see if you could overtake faster, someone. Overtake I mean, the guy. Yeah. yeah, it was you all this. Everybody's saving tires, saving fuel, kind of just trying to eke out a little bit more performance. I just find it amazing that everybody does it at once. Like all the top, but essentially the top four were all like, okay, well, if the car's going to set the pace like this, we're not going to change our strategy. We're just going to wait. And maybe that's where Mercedes' first mistake was, is that they could have pushed a little more. I just don't think that Lewis Hamilton thinks he can overtake anyone. Like, I really... He seemed really down this year on his ability to overtake. He's often got on the radio and said, I just can't get past him, or I need more power, or do something different. Um, The guy in front of me is racing, Mm. uh, you know, unsportsmanlike fashion. He just doesn't seem to back his overtaking ability these days. Maybe he's just trying to be really careful and make sure he doesn't DNF because, you know, there's he's not so far ahead in the championship now that a couple of DNFs could, you know, especially if it was Charles Leclerc or Sebastian Vettel who went and just win the, won two races that, that Hamilton DNF'd, the championship could be back on pretty quickly. So maybe he's just playing it very, very, very conservatively. But... Mm. It seems like Mercedes don't really have a development answer. Ferrari just keep kind of pushing the car forward, and maybe Mercedes have hit diminishing returns. Their car's been so good for um, basically the entire this entire kind of hybrid uh, stint in Formula One that maybe it is just kind of over. Uh, so it does it does spell good things for Ferrari in the next period. Um, where, however, did Ferrari kind of get a bit lucky here because it was. Interesting that they called Vettel in first to pit, where you would expect Charles Leclerc to have kind of the advantage. And the fact that he was winning, had taken pole, had proved that he was having a great weekend, that maybe that was his team's call to be able to let him come and pit first. But instead, they gave it to Vettel. Mm. Do you think that was the where they just kind of, do they race those guys kind of separately and they were just doing everything they could to protect Vettel? It was very close when Leclerc finally did come in and <clears> came <throat> out of his pit lane, out of the pit lane. It was like there was half a second in it. So yeah. maybe they just weren't expecting Vettel to have such a good outlap. Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. I think, um, I mean, people have been analyzing this since the end of the race and saying, you know, Vettel just hit the hammer down just the right time, had an amazing in-lap and amazing outlap, and that was what made the difference. I'm like, well, I mean, that might have been the difference between him coming out ahead of Leclerc or behind, but I mean, the, he was, you know, whatever, three and a half seconds behind Leclerc. So, I mean, he didn't make up all of that time. But, uh, I mean, I think the explanation from Ferrari was we, tr- we had to pit him to defend from Verstappen and we were trying to undercut uh, Hamilton, which is, Hamilton. okay, that's fine. Mm-hmm. There was clearly a little gap that they saw that they were like, yeah, we can drop you into that gap and you can floor it. But, uh, I mean, you could have done that with Leclerc as well. And I guess their thinking was Leclerc's in the lead, controlling everything. Hamilton's behind. The threat is from Hamilton to Leclerc, obviously. So they were thinking, well, uh, let's protect Leclerc from the undercut by pitting Vettel. And then, you know, Hamilton can react to that if he wants, but then he'll end up behind Vettel. Or he can stay out, which is what uh, what happened. And, well, he probably stayed out way, way, way too long. And my favorite, I think I tweeted this as well. One of my favorite calls was uh, they, they, on Sky, they threw to uh, Corinne Chandok just as they were getting a radio message between uh, Hamilton and his engineer. And the engineer was telling Hamilton, don't worry, it's still close. And Chandok was like, close to what? What? Like, what are you close to? I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, he's not going to win. <laughs> no, you're just you're getting way further away from everything. So unless you're meaning close to losing, then uh, unless it's opposite day, then you're probably making the wrong wrong decision, mate. Um, <clears throat> I thought it was interesting too that um, that Mercedes told Bottas to go slower so that ah, when Mercedes James. When, when when Hamilton pitted, he would come out in front and. Um, I think there was probably a lot of traffic behind Bottas that they didn't want Hamilton to fall into. And they were like, Bottas, do us a solid and just back him up so that we that Hamilton's got a little gap to, to fall into. I would have been livid about that. But Bottas apparently said, 
Um, yeah, look, that's the, we're a team that happens sometimes. Uh, I don't mind. Mm. That, which was an interesting approach compared to Leclerc's uh, furious reaction at <laughs> at that's pitting right. and then coming out uh, behind, um, uh, you know, being behind Vettel after the pit stops. And it's like, wow, the, 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 the tension between those two teammates compared to the Zen master that is Volteri Bottas. It was a real, um, the, you know, the, the juxtaposition there is pretty dry, drastic. Yeah, I wanted to. I almost wanted to see if there was more radio messages between Bottas and his specific race engineer because it was James, what's his face at Mercedes, you know, the kind of the, had to come on and be like, "All right, uh, Valtteri, you need to do one forty eight eight or whatever it was." Mm-hmm. And Valtteri was already going around like one forty fives, so it was like <laughs> just scrub off a huge amount of speed. Just pretend like everything's gone bad. Um, don't press any of the make go fast buttons. Just turn everything down. Um, I wonder if they'd maybe asked him to do that already and he'd kind of gone like, no, maybe not. And they had to mm. kind of go higher up the chain and have them come on. It does say something if they just went straight higher up the chain and just said, hey, you know what, mate, uh, just slow down right away because they knew he might kind of fight back. Um, because this was never particularly Hamilton's, like at that point, it's not, it wouldn't have really made a difference um, to Hamilton's race. He just would have finished behind Bottas. So, uh, I don't really understand the need for that. It's just kind of yeah. them flexing that Hamilton is the number one driver, seeming at every opportunity, which is kind of sucky, I would say, you know, at Mercedes. And yeah. once again, you look at Bottas, because it, it, it always shows, right, when Mercedes don't have a great weekend, Bottas always comes out looking even worse because <laughs> he's got nothing to rely on. So it's it's not very fair. Um, one thing I would like to say about Charles Leclerc, um, how articulate he is on the radio whilst driving around a street circuit at full pace. Just being mm. like, now, I'd just like you to hear how I feel and my opinion, which is in these three points um, yeah. for a congruous statement about yeah. how you diddled me. His mindfulness uh, <laughs> exercises are just getting working over time there. <laughs> yeah. I, so, yeah, I if, again, if I was Charlotte Claire, I'd just be like, this is you're making this really difficult for me that I've got to you know here I am trying to rest Um, the team kind of to be my team and yet you're doing everything you can to make sure I don't um, the thing that I would have the best fighting chance yeah the thing I would say is that it's a good leveler at Ferrari I think in so many ways obviously takes a bit of pressure off Vitaly who hasn't won a race in every year um equalizes the team a little bit is in the in the sense of well you've had a couple of wins now Vettel's got to win you know it's it just it's not all about you all that sort of stuff um it might be good for Leclerc because um he has had times I'm thinking Monaco and to some degree to some degree this race when things seem like they weren't going his way he does seem to ball up all of his anger and almost wanted to like throw it out the window uh, as he drives past the pit lane <laughs> at the garage and be like, oh, I'm just going to crash this car just to spite you. Um, so I think that's something that if he has a flaw, as far as I'm concerned, that's it at the moment, just controlling that. And he showed this race at least that even though he was obviously feeling that fury, um, he could still deliver the result, which is what everyone wants. Um, unlike Monaco where he just yeah turned his car into a weapon and, and hit someone. Um so that's good. Um, and I think post-race, when the situation was explained to him in a bit more of a calm, uh, detailed, level-headed way, I think he cooled a little bit and maybe saw things a little bit more uh, favorably. But I, I think there's no question that Vettel did nothing wrong. I think it's not even really... I wouldn't say that Ferrari screwed up, but uh, it was a happy accident for them that might uh, produce some fruitful uh, results. And and it reminded me of a few years ago when I think it was when it was was 2016 when Rosberg and Hamilton were really at the pointy end of their little messy battle. And um, I think that the team might have done something to screw over Hamilton and they really wanted to, they really wanted Hamilton to win. They just couldn't find a way to to make it happen. (laughs) And then Rosberg went off the track (laughs) and then Hamilton just drove right past him and they were kind of looking at each other like, holy shit, what did, (laughs) like our our, our lucky numbers have just come up, you know? And I feel like you probably feel like that way at the moment too. Yeah. I, I couldn't give, I don't think I can give Ferrari credit for purposely getting uh, Sebastian Vettel the win because I do think it was a, at least in some way accidental. It's just yeah, an odd thing sure. to do to to pit your guy 
uh, who's not winning. They're just, But maybe <laughs> that's what I meant well, by in my, my 30 yeah. second recap is they got the strategy half right, which is they got the one two. And that's what, you know, the, I think that's what Ferrari need right now is if at the races where they're dominating, they should be getting both guys over the line in one two. Yeah. Um, and that would really show Mercedes and really shows the rest of the, the, the Formula One that they're, that they are kind of back. Mm-hmm. Um, I, although I don't really know what, for I being back actually means these days, but it means a one-two for them in Singapore, which is not a place that anybody expected Ferrari to be getting a one-two. So yeah. I would say it's incredibly positive for them. Uh, I think, it, as I said, that a lot of safety cars towards the end there took a lot of pressure off them because nobody was really coming at them. It meant also that Leclerc, kind of the last kind of 10 laps, he was like, I'm just going to back off Vettel because there's no point in trying to overtake him around here because we'll probably crash um, and it will probably be Vettel's fault. So mm-hmm. I'm just going to pause everything and take a breather which by the time they got around to the the team photos Leclerc was looking pretty happy so you yeah know, live to fight another day not that I think it would have worked out that way but Hamilton did set himself up for one of those late charges on fresher tires mm-hmm. and as we pointed out there was like whatever 600 million uh, safety cars to finish off the race so that kind of uh, n- mitigated his advantage because it meant that by towards the, the you know the final laps of the race uh, the Ferrari drivers were still on good tires, um, but I, I just don't know that that would have really made enough of a difference. Not in Singapore, not when you know Leclerc can control the pace and do you know four laps a, four seconds a lap slower and, and Hamilton seemingly can't do anything about it. But yeah, all these um, all these late safety cars for cars that hit the wall, cars that drove into each other. Um, I guess the most notable one was the Ricardo one, because obviously Ricardo, as you say, he had a number of issues in qualifying, resulting in him finishing at the mm. starting, starting from the back of the grid. And was doing pretty well, worked his way up through the field and was, you know, he was probably on track to get some points, you'd have to say. Gets a puncture trying to get past uh, Giovinazzi, which... Uh, I thought the move was pretty. Mm, he would he would he would, have, he would have been lucky to get it off. He had big balls going. It was on a desperate and pulling move. a move. Yeah, it was desperate for sure. I mean, he was taking big risks and hoping for moderate uh, returns. And if you make that bet enough times, sooner or later you're going to lose. So I thought it was a little bit sloppy, maybe that particular one. Um, but then you know uh, he pitted, got new tires, and sort of from memory did a similar thing again, maybe, but. Uh, didn't get into the points. I don't even remember. Did he finish the race? Uh, probably not. It was a late night for me. Um, yeah, he, yeah. Did, he did. But yeah, he did. He yeah. made it. He tried to make a couple more overtakes and would, when he didn't make them because it was so close because it was post safety cars all the time. Yes. He, right. Basically Couldn't trying to make an, anybody trying to make an overtake immediately became, um, threatened from the car behind them. So yeah. we saw it with all the Haas drivers, uh, both Haas drivers is that every time they tried to do anything, three cars would get past them. You know, there was a point where it looked like Magnuson was actually going to finish with the point and the commentators even said it was like, Hey, look, Haas aren't falling back down the grid towards the end of the race. And then he finished, what did he finish? Like 16th or something? Mm-hmm. Like it was just so poor. That it was just like, oh, 17th. Oh, he a, finished last. Yeah. Uh, except for the people who didn't qualify. Result. Just a um, throwaway for Haas. Yeah, just a whole big one. It was just a big waste. Um, mm. No, who's back, Haas, though. Yeah, Torpedo. He's back. Daniel back Kibia, He's back. Just drove <laughs> late break, hard on the brakes. Kimi Raikkonen just going about his own business and little does he know, Daniel Kvyat just comes up the inside and just basically drives off the track straight into Kimi Raikkonen, who's trying his best to avoid him. Breaks Raikkonen's front uh, left suspension, like the suspension just goes bloop, just <laughs> wheels pointing in. Then you're like, well, that's you done. Sorry, mate. Not much you can do from there. So it was from what we'd seen a relatively composed um, Daniel this season and yet uh, just put his bankers on, forgot about everything and went for it, which was a really, really, really poor move. Considering all race, we'd seen a lot of good moves from, A, as we said, Daniel Ricciardo, but we saw them from um, Albon as well, moving through the field. Yeah. So it was um, it was a, an awkward, awkward exchange. It's a difficult one for me because I think that, uh, I mean, there are some corners in particular where lots of different drivers pulled overtakes and some of them would just dive. Well, they're all diving down the inside, but sometimes they would make it and it would be clean and it'd be like, great move. Other times they'd make contact and then they'd be like, oh, that was close, but 50-50. Other times they wouldn't take each other out and they'd be like, oh, that was clearly that guy's fault. I'm like, they're all doing the same thing. It's just a different result. So I don't know. I just don't know how you can call one a great move and the other one's a stupid, like suicidal move. I don't know, but uh, that's why those guys get paid the big bucks. And that's why I'm sitting here recording in my living room. Um, yeah, look, I mean, all this late safety cars meant not really much could happen. Sometimes a late safety car can really bring a race to life. But when you have three or four, uh, especially in Singapore and you bunch the pack together, it just doesn't really, just, just doesn't really work, does it? 
No, I mean, it was good that everybody was kind of in touching distance for a long time, um, mm. especially at the start because Leclerc was backing everybody up. It did mean – it did complicate things because no one had really a pit window – to a slot to kind of come back out after pitting, especially the leaders. It was like, you want to come out in 15th behind all of the people who are way slower than you? Good luck with that. Which maybe yeah. that's why Ferrari pitted Vettel the minute they had an opportunity or the second they had an opportunity. They're like, just get him in now. Quick, go. So yeah. uh, it was interesting for that moment. It, look, it was a riveting race, I would say, from start to finish, except the brakes during safety cars. But at least it's a pretty <laughs> interesting track to watch, even when they're poodling around, not doing much. Um I always, like, again, it is interesting to me that they still let them drive around when there's, like, removal vehicles on the track. I do sometimes feel like, not to go all the way back deep into that discussion of, is safety car even really the right move when you've got people on the track trying to remove cars? But maybe we should just bring people in the pits and give them a break and remove a car and then restart the race um, under safety car conditions um, just for one or two laps to get everybody warmed up again and then they could go i feel like that would even make the work of removing a car even faster because there'd be no one to really avoid i guess you uh you know you can focus on the job without we're having to worry and monitor oh the car's coming am i going to die when you build my car but yeah. i don't know maybe it's something to think about i'm, I'm sure i know I, I wrap myself in mental uh, uh, ribbons a while ago in not <laughs> trying to work out why don't they just let all the lapped cars into the pit lane and then they can just join at the end of the snake and then I realized oh but then there'll be a lap down they will have done a lap less you'll have one car oh. who's done one lap less right behind that a car that's done one lap more it's not fair but uh, you know you know you, I lose a lot of sleep thinking about this kind of stuff obviously um, the only thing I wanted to mention the, to finish off the race recap was the uh, Kevin Magnussen get hit by the old sandwich bag the old sandwich bag in the front wing trick oh, it's the third time I've fallen through this year and uh, he had to retire he had to not retire he had to pit for a new front wing and then uh by the time he came out he was dead last and they gave him a uh consolatory pit stop for fresh tires towards the end when, after which he nabbed the fastest lap so well done came ag you're not leaving with nothing but close to nothing Oh, well, look I mean, should we just whilst we're talking about Haas, quick shout out to the fact that it, they've locked in Grosjean and Magnussen for next yes. season, which dream is the only reason because Netflix said to them, hey, you guys are providing all of the drama and all of the fun times on the show. Could, we, oh. could you just do that for one more season? Like, it's it, – why is this? Like, Paul, Nico Hulkenberg was like, I've been replaced, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to go to that cool American team where they're going to love me when all my great charisma um, and all my ability to speak English, and now he doesn't have a drive. So what's, yeah. what's, do you got an opinion on this in the inside uh, goss? Uh, I mean, I think Hulkenberg's cooked. I don't think he's going to end up anywhere and he'll be done. He won't come back. We're, we're, you know, enjoy, e. If you're a Hulkenberg fan, enjoy these races. He's, you're not going to see him again. He's done. Yeah. That's a shame. That's a real um, shame. There was, I mean, the, the, the I real saw, shame is that you've got, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> he gets kicked out of Renault. That's fine. You know, Esteban Ocon's no, no slouch. But I mean, this sport, they you are know, keeping Grosjean and getting rid of Hulkenberg. Like, what? What the, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, at least he's got the rest of the season to try and get himself a podium. So maybe Daniel Ricciardo should oh, like try and take call. out the leaders one, one weekend just to make sure Hulkenberg gets on the podium one time. Yeah. Well, after Vettel went and screwed my prediction that Albon would win a race before Vettel did. Now the new, oh. new Supervisor's prediction is uh, Hulkenberg will get a podium in the next, <laughs> next few races and next finish high. Races. <laughs> <laughs> um, Zach, let's get a league, let's get into the fuff fuff fantasy focus. Let's have a look at the league. Now, it would be hubris, or not hubris, but it would be less than humble for me to point out the results. So I'll leave it to you. Could you please tell us how we went in the fantasy league this week? Uh, well, I got distracted by all my um, all of my fun times of mm -hmm. travel and and podcasting and and a little bit of time off at work and all this kind of stuff. And I forgot to predict. I had my Oops. eyes on other prizes. And um, because of that, and also because my team is junk, um, <laughs> no thanks to Haas, I dropped nine places where oh, God, I, look, I don't want to, I don't want to put the moz on you, but you've moved up four posies this week. And Ooh. I would say leaders watch out because Rod's yeah. making a run for the league, mate. He's, he's, this is a late charge. This yep. is the, this is the Albon. Of, of charges. Here he comes. If I can make up four places every race, I only need the season to have an extra five or six races at the end of the season, and I'll be number one, baby. Number one. Ah, uh, don't forget other. Yeah, see, other people could really drastically fail, though. Maybe Ferrari and Mercedes will stop winning races, and your team mm. of all Haas and McLaren drivers will work. Mm. Um, 
Let's talk about the winners uh, or the great performers from this weekend. Uh, the Tifosi boys of Drew B. G. tied with pedal power from Colin Wilkes, followed closely by Team Blue and Gold from uh, Layboy O'Donnell. It was Ooh. very tight at the top from the Singapore Grand Prix. Some great predicting there. Um, but no change uh, at the top of the table where we've got Hawkmoon Racing, who's still winning overall. But Scuderia Benetti is going to work really hard. I can tell. To close yeah. that gap, Team Scuderia Benetti. So I'm hoping for a grandstand finish over these last few races. But it's all to play for because, as we can see, it's hard to predict right now uh, who's going to perform. <laughs> yes. So if you need to make some changes to your teams, now's the time. Are you going to sub in Ferrari? Are you going to take out Mercedes? Do you have what it takes to make the right call? The pressure is on and it's all to play for in the Super License League. Well, Zach, the other thing that we have to get into is a super quiz. So let's play that bumper and then let's do that thing. We will accept a couple of questions. Should one only win one? Would one want to have won that one in round one? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> Zach, it's time for me to quiz you. And of course, with the announcement from Robert Kubica that he's leaving F1, this might be our only chance to do a proper Robert Kubica quiz, your favorite driver. (laughs) So we've got, let's do the traditional thing. One, two, three, four, five questions about Robert Kubica's career. I didn't count this year as one of his years of driving in Formula One. Oh, we, take we, that, we watched Robert. It. No, I'm saying we watched it. It's not Oh, so no easy questions. Not who who was he, you know. it's it's we, we've, we've lived that year recently, but I wanted to look back at his career. So I've got one question for each year of his career from 2006 oh. to 2010. Obviously, he got injured at the start of 2011 and couldn't uh, drive anymore in Formula One. So I've got one question from each year, highlighting one year that he, that he you know, one of the highlights from his career, I suppose. And... I'm going to be asking you all of them, and I'm going to be um, maybe providing a few hints along the way for these years that you maybe weren't watching the sport and stuff. But this is you're going to leave learning a little about Robert Kubica in this week's Kubic quiz. 2006, Zach, after being named reserve driver for BMW Sauber, Kubica was promoted into the team, becoming Poland's first F1 driver and the first F1 driver in over a decade to achieve what in his first three races? Ooh, I'm going to say that he, in his first three races, he achieved podiums? He, you're correct. The correct, well, the, the, the fully correct answer is he scored a podium finish in one of his first three races. And it had been, Oh, I thought it meant maybe all three. No, not all three. It had been a decade <laughs> since another driver had won, had scored a podium in one of his first three races. Um... And then uh, I misread this when I read the Wikipedia page, and I was like, ah, oh, he was the last driver to, to get a podium in one of his first three races. That's cool. And then I realized, oh, no, wait, K-Mag did it in Melbourne on his first race, Camp P2. And then right. I'm, like, I'm pretty sure Hamilton did as well. So I looked up Hamilton. This is 2006. Hamilton joined in 2007, and he ah. scored podiums for nine of his first races. <laughs> wow. His first nine races, he was on the podium. That's a good so, car. We went 10 years without any good uh, rookie drivers, and then all of a sudden, Lewis Hamilton just blew it all out of the water. Um, moving on to 2007, proper, especially for Robert Kubica, uh, he was involved in a spectacular crash in Canada, pinballing across the track at over 300 kilometers per hour. After being mildly yeah. concussed, Kubica sat out the US Grand Prix that year, but was replaced by the BMW Sabo reserve driver. Zach, name that reserve driver. Oh, BMW Sauber reserve driver. What year? 2007. Now, that might seem impossible, but he, this driver will be very front of mind at the moment. God, 2007. That's more than... Oh, my God, that's 12 years ago. Uh, so many years ago. Was it Sebastian Vettel? Yeah, it was. Bang. Oh. <laughs> right on it. Ooh. Sebastian Vettel took the stadium for Kubica when he had a concussion. Um, yeah, man, good call, good pull. Like, I really Ooh. just put it all out there. But, I mean, you're kind of thinking, like, Rod wouldn't give me a question like that unless he maybe thinks I might get it. And yeah. I guess, right, we both win in this case. Uh, we move on to 2008. A year later, Kubica scores his maiden victory at that same track in Canada uh, while controlling the pace. It wasn't as easy for him, um, and Kubica was in a three-way scrap with two other drivers. Zach, tell me the two other drivers, and I'll give you a hint. One was a Ferrari driver, and one was a McLaren driver. Uh, Oh, goodness me. Ferrari driver and a McLaren driver. Was it Felipe Massa and... Oh, 2008 no. McLaren. So I'll give you a hint. Both of these drivers are still on the on on, on the grid right now. On the grid right now. So it was mm-hmm. was it Kimi Raikkonen and Lewis Hamilton? 
Yes, it was. And all three of them pulled into the pits, and there was a red line at the end of the pit lane. Yes. <laughs> Kubica and pulls up and stops. There. Yeah. Raikkonen pulls up and stops. Hamilton, um, not so much. He runs into the back of that. Kimi, takes yeah. them both out. <laughs> And then Kubica has only his teammate to beat, which he does comfortably to win oh, his maiden victory in so Canada. Good. Yeah. Um, lots of great, yeah, lots of great stories from this career. Um, okay, let's move on to 2009. BMW, unfortunately, weren't competitive. And despite a podium in Brazil, among his few other highlights for the season was Robert Kubica sweating it out for the last points paying position at this track. Name that track, Zachary. Sweating it out. Ooh, sweating it out. Last points playing position. Uh, well, it does sound like it's meant to be Singapore if you're sweating it out. Um, but what are the other hot ones? Was it like was it like Bahrain? Was Bahrain even on the thing yet? Yeah, let's go with that. No, I trust you got mate. You should go and swing it with Singapore. With Singapore. Um, Fuck. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he finished eighth, which was the last points paying position then, because they used to have points back to eight. Now they have points back to ten. But oh, um, yeah, he said uh, he said at the end of it that it was the most hard fought point that he's ever you know achieved. Which I would kind of mm. argue, having recovered for the last eight years and gotten back into Formula One to score a point, that's probably harder. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, no, it was a pretty lean year, but <clears throat> got a podium in Brazil, did pretty well in this particular track that we've just had, Singer the Poor. And the last question, Zach, <clears throat> covering 2010, uh, BMW Sauber disappears, Kubica signs with Renault, and his reputation mm. as a great driver is forever cemented with podium places in Australia and which three other tracks where the driver's skill makes the most difference? Uh, I'm going to say Spa. Mm-hmm. Is one of them. That's one. Uh, that's one. Maybe Monaco is another. Mm-hmm. You're two for two. Two for two. Um, it does feel like it should be Singapore again. Um, so Singapore? Mm-hmm. Starts with this. Well, the track's name oh. starts with this. <laughs> the track's name starts with uh, was it? Was it Suzuka? Yeah, Suzuka. Although, yeah. He, I mean, he was running in P2. He did retire because his tyre fell off. But still, podium in Australia. But then, podium in Monaco, podi- podium in Belgium, pro- uh, podium position in Suzuka. And, you know, the F1 journalists were just falling over themselves with praise oh, to say, He's you know, the the, I, mean, I don't know, that drives you crazy. That's why I brought it up. But, oh. yeah, in, given the car that he was in, not really, uh, you know, a performant car, but uh, just muscling the crap out of it and at races where the driver's skill really shows and his, you know, his efforts are rewarded, uh, he got uh, results at those races. That was what really cemented his, uh, you know, his reputation as being a real driver's driver and I know that drives you crazy, so I wanted to finish the quiz on that. <laughs> he's, a, he's a real Formula One nerds driver. That's what mm-hmm. I... That's oh, yeah, that's frustrating. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, God, he is a driver's driver, though, and he is he is great, and he's absolutely lovely in all the press I've seen of him. So I hope he goes on to... Do we know what he's doing post this season? Maybe he'll be taking a development role at Williams or something uh, like that. But we wanna, we, I, I, I like having him around the sport, so hopefully he's doing something <laughs> sure. within the sport. Sure you do, since you love him so much. <laughs> Take your opportunity to praise him, and don't say he's overrated at all. Um, although I think that the whole you know, garbage about him, you know, the greatest comeback in sport is, is way overdone. I mean, Nicky Lauda's comeback was better and that's just in this sport, let alone the whole of sport. But, um, I, there's, there's so many repeated and strong rumors that he's going to DTM next year. Uh, those, those are hard to ignore. You'd probably imagine that he's probably already signed a contract and can't announce it yet. But, uh, you know, I mean, he's announced pretty early that he's leaving. Uh, to me, that kind of suggests that he's got something else lined up. Um, but yeah, DTM, I expect, unless we hear something else. I don't think he'll go to like Formula E or whatever, because that seems to be like a, a sport for young roosters or, you know, those, uh, you know, like Nico Hulkenberg needs to find a seat. So there won't be room enough for, for Kubica there. Um, Zach, we've done the race. We've done the quiz. It's time for our final thoughts for the week. Um, I wanted to, I want to throw something out there, but I kind of want to get your thoughts on the thing that I'm going to throw out there. So I don't know if you want to reciprocate in that wise or a different wise, 
But uh, no, no, I'll let's leave throw it out. Let's, get, let's keep the no, no. You go for it. <laughs> throw the thought out. Maybe I'll have another thought built on that. <laughs> so, final thought. You've been calling for this for a long time. It's finally been floated officially uh, as an idea that we will turn qualifying into a sprint race where the, the drivers line up in reverse championship order and have a sprint race to determine qualifying. Um, I've, I've always thought that was not not very good. Uh, Hamilton and Vettel <laughs> seem to have used even stronger language. Um, I want to get your thoughts on that. It'll be super exciting because qualifying is a bit boring. Um, and... Uh, it's a great way to get broken cars the day before the race. <laughs> um, that, that's that's going to happen. You know that's definitely going to happen with this like ragtag bunch of rogues that we have mm-hmm. on the grid these days. Sure. Um, look, that's the, a real shame about qualifying right now. You know, if you go and watch qualifying highlights, the highlights go for about four minutes because it is the last 22 seconds of each round of qualifying. The rest of it just doesn't really matter. So I feel like... This would be really exciting, but what they really should do is just give drivers like, hey, you get two turns to set the fastest lap that you can. Um, here's, you know, here's two periods to do it, and that's it. You know, go for it, everyone. Um, it's uh, it seems stupid because I think they know that the only way you can get really fast times in qualifying and really have the best cars fight it out is to have fewer cars on the track at once, which is what you get in Q3 because everybody else has been, you know, you're down to 10 drivers. And these days, a couple of those drivers don't even bother putting in times anymore because they're like, well, we were just lucky to get into Q3, so we're happy to start 9 to 10 <laughs> um, and not burn any tires. So it's it's frustrating. I would like to see more stuff tried, but this is the problem with Formula 1 is you can't really experiment because... It, there's no every race is really important to every team and every driver you know every point is so important so how do you how do you make something like this work do, can you run a can you run a sim of what it would be like maybe with ai could you or run it in like an esports league to see if that mm. works and see how that pans out but yeah i'd be all for more racing uh in formula 1 um, over the weekend because God knows no one's watching practice um, and qualifying can be a little bit of a struggle to get through. Um, especially maybe it's just the fact that there's only a few drivers you can get pole these days. So mm, what do you think? Um, I, I just think that we have the race and that's the race. I, I'd rather, I don't know. I, I, I like the idea of qualifying being a lap, a single lap, not a, not who wins a race. Um, especially if you think about like, what do you do if there's, um, you know, yellow flags, safety cars during qualifying? I mean, it gets it gets a bit silly, you know. It really does get a bit silly. Um, and I know that other formulas will have like a sprint race and then a reverse sprint race. I'm like, well, that's okay because those are races, and they, you know, they, they're, they're race races. <laughs> they're not just, um, they're not the real deal. They are kind of. Um, like they don't they don't have consequences beyond the thing that you're doing right then, as opposed to qualifying, which has consequences for the starting order of the race. So unless you're going to order, yeah. uh, unless you're going to offer some kind of points and say, well, this is for qualifying, but it's also some kind of race, I'm, I'm kind of dead against it. The only thing I was thinking just then, I've never thought of this before, is maybe we do something where the teammates line up literally right next to each other at the start finish line. The lights go off and they have to race. It's it's like like a like a practice start almost. They do they they do a lap, and that determines which of the two drivers is faster. And then yep. the um, instead of having Q three, where you have the top you know the fastest ten cars all racing off, we, we do that except that's only one car from each of the um, one car from each team basically. Yeah, yeah, I could I, I could imagine just something that. different. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, just something different. I think and this you- just all stems from the fear that like everything seems kind of made up to make sure that the best drivers end up on pole, like from the best teams that, and we get a really true reflect, like that we get a grid that somehow reflects the true pace of every single car. But then like, that's, should we just take the grid from the last race then and make that the starting grid? Mm-hmm. Like the the way that they all finished last week, because that's the most recent up-to-date reflection on how good every driver is. So should we just make that the starting grid next time and say, okay, well, there is no qualifying. It's just how you all finished last time is how it's going to start next time um, and see how you go from there. Because I just don't think, especially at Mercedes, that they set their car up or design their car to 
kind of race from behind or uh, race to overtake. They set it up so that it can take pole and then it will win from the front every week. Uh, and I think we're seeing that that is the problem for Mercedes right now is that, that when they find themselves out of position, they're like, well, let's just hope something else happens. See if we can pull an undercut because we can't <laughs> race anyone. We're not quite fast enough. Or uh, well, the car is just isn't very good at following. And uh, I think it, it makes the whole thing kind of less interesting and less competitive. You want the grid to be a little bit uneven, like it is in, you know, Formula Two. You know, the amount of times Charles Leclerc had to, in those reverse grid races, come back from the back and race his way through the field to win. Like that's why he's so good at managing pace and overtaking and all those kinds of things, especially on tracks he's familiar with, because he gets a huge amount. Of, he had a huge amount of practice with it. Whereas, you know, it, I don't think we see that as much, you know, uh, anymore. And I reckon we should just pick it out of a hat, maybe make the grid totally random. I don't know, just anything to to bring the races a little bit more to life. Because usually I'm a real, I'm one for a real stickler for like look, the best performance performers should win. But Formula One isn't that kind of sport. I think it's it should be a little bit more um, a little bit more up for grabs than that. And if it's true that you have to put in a really great whole weekend performance to truly be the best on you know, to, to take the win, then you should be able to fight your way through the field regardless of what the grid is. So I think it just says something about the sport that it's just not very even, that someone who starts 10th is, has basically no chance of winning. Yeah, I feel like those problems are problems of the sport more so than things that can be tweaked in qualifying. But yeah, I just haven't heard any qualifying format that convinces me it's going to be better than what we currently have, even if that is stale or boring to some or whatever. Don't really care. Mm. It still seems like the best solution. It's, it's like the best of a whole bunch of worst options. Um, often final thoughts is quite a quick pithy little thing that we finished the show on, but uh, I guess not this week, <laughs> Zach, uh, I'm going to throw the, the, throw the floor open to you. If you want to put something out there, no, it doesn't need to be a... no, that's all my thoughts. You've got like four different this. thoughts from me. Yeah, definitely. There you go. All right. Well, um, unless I'm mistaken, the next race is in Russia. Is that correct? I yeah. Get ready for an amazing great. race in Russia. They're always Ooh. really good. I'm Get super ready for psyched. some some awkward uh, cutaways to Putin in grandstands and Putin in the, the cool down room. Ooh, oh, he's going to go in the cool down there. room. Yeah, oh, he always no. does. And Vitello always oh, tries to talk to him or to, to his interpreter, even though I'm pretty sure he speaks English. He doesn't let on that he does. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be yeah. Get your tweets ready for that one. Um, well, uh, and the race is coming up very soon, I think, because it's another one of a back to back. Race. Hey, Zach, we're going to be doing three podcasts in three weeks. That's crazy. Woo. It's about time we picked up the pace a bit. They're my favorite when it just feels like we're hanging out. I was going to say. Uh, chatting so much. Of, on top of that, we're going to try and record some more episodes of Drift. So if you happen to be in the Super License Club, there's some more good shit coming your way very, very soon. If you've never joined, maybe you want to look into joining now. There's a, there's a link to the club in the navigation bar on superlicense.com.au. Check it out, see what it's about. And if you want to join, you will get super bonus uh, content sent out to you in the podcast form. Um, yeah, Zach, I think we're pretty much done. My voice is cooked and uh, it's time for me to go to bed. Yeah, all right. Well, it's time for me to go and play God of War or something. Ooh, fun. Can I stay Ooh, up and play fun. with you? Don't even have it. Yeah, I mean, you could, yeah, I could, I could <laughs> start up. I could get a Twitch account and start up a live stream that you could watch. Uh, just you, an cool. audience of one. Uh, I was talking today with someone about uh, wanting to play that Untitled Duck game where you run around and as a duck oh, yeah. and knock things over. And I was like, I want to play it. I just don't have any time to play it. And I'm like, uh, I'll just watch YouTube videos of other people playing it. <laughs> That'll give me the satisfying experience of knowing what it is without having to commit time to doing it. Yep, that's me with cooking shows. I don't want to have to, have to do all that stuff. I'm just going to look. I know how to make chicken katsu yeah. curry. I've never made it, but I know exactly how to do it. That's why I watch F1. Like, I know how to win races. I just watch other people do it. It's more fun that way. Um, it's more time efficient that way. Um, well, Zach, enjoy your week. Enjoy the Russian Grand Prix. I hope everyone enjoys the Russian Grand Prix, and we will see you on the other side of it to do this whole crazy thing again. And, um, yeah, brush up on your Russian, get your Putin tweets ready, and... Uh, we'll see you closer to that time. Until then, my name's been Rodney. My name's been Zach. Voice well, nearly cracked out. Nearly nearly went to total shit, but it didn't. Uh, until next time, we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>